Uh, Mike Rinaldi, I'm with Sanger Heart and Vascular Institute, uh, part of Atrium Healthcare in Charlotte, North Carolina. And uh, I wanted to wish you all a, a hello and warm welcome to the 2021 TVT MitraClip G4 Symposium, which will focus on uh, tailoring mitral uh, valve transcatheter repair uh, and outcomes with, um, with the G4 system. So again, I'm Mike Rinaldi, and I'll be moderating this session uh, with an excellent panel of speakers. And we'll start off uh, today with Paul Mahoney from uh, Centera Heart in Norfolk, Virginia. And he'll, he'll talk to us a little bit about the evolution of MitraClip G4 uh, with, uh, with, the, uh, with TIER. And then next will be Dr. Uh, uh, Basim Shahab, uh, and he'll talk about uh, uh, Echo Core Lab results with expanding G4 uh, study results. And then finally, Dr. Gangnam Singh with uh, UC Davis in Sacramento will uh, go over the techniques and strategies for treating complex cases with G4. In the end, we'll have hopefully some time for panel discussion and Q&A before closing. So with that, I hand it over to Paul Mahoney and take it away. Thank you. There's the disclosures, thank you. All right. So, when we look at MitraClip, um, it's been almost a 20-year journey. I first, heard of, I first heard of MitraClip when I was a fellow. I was at Ted Feldman's course in Chicago uh, with Howie Herman, who I trained with at Penn, and Fred St. Gore was talking about ideas for um, mimicking the Alfieri stitch uh, with a catheter-based approach. And from that, within a few short years, the first in human was done in 2003. So we're, we're about 18, 18 years now and counting in terms of clips in people, which seems hard to believe. First trial, Everest, the Everest II, the high-risk study in realism, access, and then COAPT in 2013 started, which, which would be critical. We'll talk a little bit more about that data. It was about that same time the MitraClip was approved, but not for all indications. And uh, you can see the host of trials that have sort of come, out, come our way. Um, COAPT data was released in 2018 at TCT. We've now got indication for both functional and degenerative. Um, and a host of trials are now undergoing, including expand, expand G4. Uh, looking at the pivotal trial, the COAP trial, for heart failure patients with significant um, uh, uh, SMR, we see the three years MitraClip continues to stabilize. It improves survival, which is a nice thing to say about a procedure that we do in a cath lab, with a 33% reduction in survival over the course of the time and a 7.9 uh, patients needed to treat to save a life. It reduces the rate of heart failure hospitalizations with a 51% reduction in heart uh, admissions for heart failure. Three patients need to be treated to reduce heart failure reduction. Uh, admission, and importantly, provides sustained reduction of MR, as you can see in the bars over here, that um, out to three years, we've seen um, excellent results in reduction of MR, and improves quality of life and functional capacity. That's in addition to guideline-directed medical therapy, which all these patients should be on as well. So, um, and it's safe, 96.6% .6 freedom from device-related complications. So this is really put on the landscape as the standard of care for patients with persistent MR despite guideline-directed medical therapy. The results are durable. When we look at COAPT and Everett realism outcomes, you see in both graphs, it's um, three to four plus on the left column at baseline, 30 days, one year, and three years. We see a persistent and durable benefit. Uh, COAPT had really amazing data with a 99% reduction uh, and persistent reduction in MR out to two years. And Everett realism is a little bit less impressive at 87, but still a persistent durable benefit in the vast majority of patients undergoing therapy. Expand, which I think we're gonna talk a little bit more uh, was an important trial, looked at over 1,000 patients with real world with, uh, who received MitraClip, saw the highest MR reduction achieved with the therapy, uh, largest one-year improvement in quality of life. This is real world, highest reduction in annualized heart failure hospitalization rates, consistent LV dimension reduction and annual st stabilization through one year, and it was safe and durable over time. Um, we also had two clips in this trial. We had the XTR and we had the NTR, and we saw the use of these allowed us to take on more complex mitral valve anatomy, uh, some more severe baseline MR and annular dimensions and large prolapse gaps that would have been excluded from earlier studies. And nearly one in five patients, again, in real world, the clinicians are taking this device on and they're applying it to anatomy, is trying to reduce it and see the type of uh, survival benefits we saw in COAP, and almost 20% of the patients had what we consider complex anatomy. In one of the earlier sessions, we were talking about red, yellow, green, uh, green, I think this would be yellow. So we've seen four generations of MitraClips, and they're built on robust clinical experience. The Gen 1 MitraClip, uh, which we, we all uh, cut our teeth on. Um, Gen 2 with NT, with be better leaflet grasping, steering enhancements, and a little wider opening. By Gen 3, we had two sizes. We had the NTR and the XTR, improved grasping, increased co-optation surface area. With the two sizes, we could customize a little bit more of the patient's anatomy. 
enhanced steering and accuracy and ease of use in the back table. And now we're at Gen 4, which is our current system, uh, which has four different sizes and the ability to choose clip and uh, based, on the, uh, based on the patient's anatomy, both vertically and horizontally, ability to grasp the leaflet simultaneously or independently, or optimize one or the other after a simultaneous grip, and then a further streamlining of the procedure and the device prep. We look at G4 overview, and we'll talk about it. Some of our other speakers will go in more depth. We have four clip options. Uh, we have a wide clips that have been added. We've added controlled grip actuation. What that does, it allows these uh, grippers to be independent. Simplified procedural steps with a 40% reduction on the back table, which is important if you're, if, uh, if like in a lot of labs, procedural efficiency and time are critical, and a streamlined deployment sequence. Delivery system is specifically designed for the mitral valve. Stable and precise steering, it's a very stable system, sits in the left atrium and left atrial pressure monitoring is now available um, to some extent. Here's the expanded clip size, tailored treatment for clip sizes. There's a 50% wider, there's, there's the two lengths, there's NT and XT, as you all know, and there's a wide and a narrow clip, 50% wider in the grasping area, and you can see the dimensions. These are important to know as you look at a posterior leaflet, especially when you're trying to select your clip and tailor it to the patient's anatomy. Um, I believe lately XTW has become the workhorse clip, although we use a lot of NTW in our lab. Um, one of the advantages of a wider clip is further reduction of MR with one clip, so potentially uh, shorter procedural times and, and, uh, and more efficacy with the, with the single clip being placed. And you can see some of the uh, benchtop research on what they think the standard uh, reduction is when you go to the wider clip. Controlled gripper activation. The movie over here will show you can either drop them in the traditional way and grasp the leaflets, or you can drop them one or the other, or you can drop them both and then release just one and optimize that, that grasper. And that gives us a lot of ability to tailor and to optimize the therapy because it's very important to get the leaflet into the part of the clip where you've got the most uh, force to hold that leaflet in there. And you'll see this, this is one of the more important slides in the deck with distributed leaflet retention force. Even with the, the bigger clips, you still have to get enough leaflet in to the area of peak load, which is indicated here uh, in the circle on the bottom, which is the same distance essentially on the NT as in the XT. So the XTW will not allow you to, to close wider gaps. It'll allow, you to get, it'll allow you to get more leaflet in there and get more radial force, but you still are obligated to get the clip in deep into the, uh, into the gripper, and, and I think these gentlemen are going to talk about that when I'm done. And wider grasp opening to facilitate closure. This was a, uh, a chart that we worked on at some length, I guess a year or two ago. Um, based on evaluation of clip selection, you know, we have four clips, when is the best time to use them? So there are three factors that are considered critical, the length of the leaflet, width of the jet, and the mitral valve area. And, and based on those factors, you would favor a wider or a narrower clip or a longer or shorter clip. If the leaflet length is less than nine, that should be a, a shorter clip, an NT or an NTW, all right? If you have a, a long leaflet greater than nine in a lot of labs such as ours, we'll, we'll wait for 1.1, 1.2. We're pretty conservative before we go to the bigger clip. Broad jet favors a wider clip. Um, a smaller valve still favors the G4 NT. And then a larger valve, we want the wider clips. Um, the fate of the XT is, is, uh, is interesting to ponder with all this. Does it have a role? Is it still being used? I think we're still working out those questions. And then lastly, currently, uh, the Expand G4 study registry is going on. This is, this is uh, piggybacking on the earlier Expand G3, contemporary world study of latest generation of microclip technologies, which is all comers, prospective multi-center, uh, single arm post-market real world observational study conducted in the US, um, looking at all, all, all consecutive patients and then following them with core lab data and see how they do in real world outcomes and try to learn more about which clips are most appropriate, clip matrix, efficacy, safety, and durability. So with that background, I think we're good on time. Mike, I think that's it, and I will turn it over to our next speaker. You did a great job of staying on time. So let me ask you a few questions since we have a little time. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, how has your, you know, CLIP started a long time ago now. Mm -hmm. it, is a, it, it has been with us for a good long time, half my career, and, um, and it has evolved. It started out as a, as a really interesting first-generation technology to a very mature fourth-generation technology. Mm -hmm. How have those changes impacted your use of the technology and its acceptance in your community, and you have a busy program. You do like 200 clips a year. How uh, how did you how do you find that? Well, you know, as as part of a comprehensive catheter-based approach to valvular management, 
you know, we started seeing a lot of, even before the clip was approved, we would see a lot of patients with mitral regurgitation. It was painful not to have something to offer them. I think once COAPT came out with the survival and reduced hospitalization data, um, the general community started to really embrace it. And now we, we are sent um, a large number of patients with MR that need to be treated. Um, not all of them have ideal anatomy. There's a lot of complex anatomy. We're trying to, we have right now a single tool with great results, and we're trying to stretch that tool as far as we can within the transcatheter edge edge repair uh, space to treat those. Um, and the data is compelling. So if you can get a good result, you can impact people. It's not a whole lot of things in interventional cardiology that prolong life and reduce hospitalization. Those are pretty hard endpoints that we like to see. So we've been pretty aggressive about it. We've gotten good results. And the best thing you can do, as I say all the time, is, if, is get a good result and send them back, and you'll get three or four more patients back. So um, careful patient selection, good results leads to. Yeah, excellent. You know, and, and sort of for secondary MR patients, uh, I see some institutions where, where they think of it as the same as primary MR for patients who are at too high risk for surgery. Do you feel like the, that, uh, that CLIP is, is um, only restricted to patients who a surgeon says no to, or is it actually a, a reasonable strategy for patients who could theoretically have a surgery? Well, that's a great question. Uh, the repair MR study hopefully is going to address some of that, you know, uh, intermediate risk patients. Uh, I like the design of the study in that it's not merely surgical risk, but age. And uh, if you're over 75, you automatically qualify. But I do think the results are, uh, you can do a clip in all, you can, it, going from the one extreme, you can usually get a clip on almost anybody. There's nobody who's really too high risk, unless they have pulmonary issues, to get through a clip procedure. On the other end, I think um, there's a couple of good comments made this morning. We've got a very high bar to get over. The surgical data is excellent. So even though the mitral clip data is very good, I think we have to show that we're at least as good as surgery in these lower and lower risk patients. Um, but I think that that's very plausible we will be, and the complication rates will be dramatically lower. So we'll see if this becomes an all-risk indication or not, but I think those studies are ongoing. It's a great yeah, question. For, sh for sure in primary MR, and even I feel like in secondary MR, uh, if a patient can be clipped, I think the, that it's first line over, over yep. surgery in secondary MR. One last question before we move on is um, what is your workhorse clip? What is your favorite clip? And, and yeah. uh, when do you find uses for the other devices? So um, I like the NTW. It's what I use about 80 to 90% of the time to start. I think most of the, uh, a lot of the data is based on that, that, that smaller design. I think you have to work a little bit harder sometimes to get a good result, but then you know if you can get a good result with NTW, you've gotten a, uh, you've gotten a, uh, a good grasp and, and, and it's, it's a little bit more stable position. Um, I think Nationally, it's probably about 50-50, maybe trending towards XTW, but I'd like to hear what the other gentlemen uh, up here use. But we're primarily uh, uh, NTW as a workhorse. Gentlemen? Yeah, I think at our, uh, at our site, primarily NTW um, is going to be the primary workhorse. There are cases where leaflet lengths are long enough, myxomatous enough, where despite having adequate vertical coaptation, we may use an NT or XTW. I'll show a case of that later on. Just increases your tissue bridge and certainly decreases the amount of clips you need. No, definitely NTW. Uh, uh, mainly for if it's a secondary MR, it's definitely an NTW. If it's a primary MR and I have a lot of tissue, XTW is my primary. Yeah. And how about you, Mike? Yeah, I think we all center around the same, yeah. the same area. Can I make one quick comment about the secondary MR? No, real quick. You know, the, the guidelines, the recent update in the guidelines have really emphasized the role of tier for treatment of secondary MR. It's a class of recommendation 2A versus isolated secondary MR. It's now basically a 2B. And we've had heart failure doctors, referring physicians, really take on to that. And, and that's really expanded our patient pool. And in fact, some of my biggest referrers are heart failure doctors based on the recent escalation in the guidelines. Yeah, I, I think there are a couple of factors. We've seen very similar, and the other has been the change in the organ procurement and the, and the transplant bad mm -hmm. uh, diagram. Our guys really favor CLIP as a bridge to transplant rather than uh, going down a sort of the destination LVAD route. Absolutely. We've seen a huge spike in referrals from our heart failure guys, even in young patients. Yeah. So. No, I mean, it's, it's very important. Uh, we are seeing the same uptick. But it also depends on uh, how good of MR reduction you're doing in the case. So that's something people have to understand is it doesn't matter if you're class 2A, class 2B, if you're just putting one clip and leaving uh, moderate MR and say that's good, then that's not going to be good enough. So really uh, maximizing MR reduction as long as the amount of uh, anatomy allows that is going to be crucial to keep that class 2A, 2B indication Absolutely. like this. All right, with that, thank yep. you, Paul. And we'll move uh, on to uh, Dr. Shahab and 
We'll talk about Core Lab echo results from the G4 uh, registry, expand registry. Thank you. All right, thank you, everyone. <clears throat> thank you, Mike. Uh, so we're going to be talking uh, on behalf of the Expand G4 investigator. I'm going to be talking about the uh, Core Lab Echo uh, outcome in the Expand G4 study. And uh, I'm going to touch at the end a little bit about the Repair MR uh, study, and I'm going to show you a case that really highlights the future of the G4 system. And you know the G4 study is, uh, is an all-comer, real-world, contemporary experience on what we can achieve using dual generation Maticlip system, the fourth generation system, uh, by using the extra option that that device can offer us. Four different kind of clips, uh, two wide, two shorter, uh, longer and a narrower clip, and really the uh, independent gripper actuation feature that allows us to further and more precisely uh, capture uh, matter valve tissue inside the clip and allow us to optimize our result and optimize our, uh, our outcome. So uh, really, these are my disclosures. So uh, compared to the expand trial uh, that Paul just talked about, which is really using the third generation system, the expand G4 uh, so far from a baseline uh, demographics are the same. There's really, really no major differences. There's an average STS repair score of six on both of them. The only difference I would mention is that the matter valve complexity is slightly higher in the Expand G4 at around 23% versus 18%, uh, which is not a surprise. You know, we're, we're tackling more complex anatomy. It's a real-world study, and uh, it's a device that allows us to, uh, with a newer feature, maybe to tackle more options. Uh, regarding the clip usage, you know, uh, the water clip is the primary clip, whether an NTW or an SCW in the trial. Uh, and from a clip mix, you know, 87% are treated with one uh, clip and one wide clip. And this is the beauty of that newer system is by hopefully having wider clip, it allows you maybe to able to treat more anatomies and uh, better MR reduction without having to add a lot of clips. 60% of them were treated with an NTW alone, which was the primary, or followed by another clip. And uh, really that other clip usually is the NT. Uh, more subjects treated with one clip than the expand study, 61% versus 55%. And usually in the double clip mix, the second clip was mainly the NT. So NTW as primary and NT as the secondary clip. Uh, what we have noticed is there's now a lot of usage of the XT. It's less than 3% compared out of all the four clips. That was the one that was used the most, uh, used the least, I'm sorry. Uh, because of these extra option and feature, we have the Maticlip G4, even though it's an all-comer, real-world uh, uh, study, the, we found that there's increased uh, procedure efficiency. The implant success rate was 99%, with an acute procedure success rate of 99%, which is higher than the 96% than the expand. All this with a device time on average of 39 minutes versus 46 minutes with the third generation system. So really, uh, the extra features allowed us to keep uh, at par with most other uh, results we have with different study and actually further improve on them by more acute procedural success and really less device time. From an echo core lab adjudicated MR severity, what we have found is almost 91% of people achieved uh, MR0 or 1 plus reduction in the expand G4, with almost 97% had reduction uh, to less than moderate at 30 days. Really pretty good outcome at par with everything else with some slight improvement compared to what we had before. Uh, there's also improvement in the functional capacity and quality of life as seen by, by the NYHA class changes and by the KCCQ uh, score. So again, uh, at par with everything else we had. All these extra improvements, what we have absorbed, observed is, are done without any increased adverse events uh, with that system. Really all cause death is the same at 2%. SLDA, two cases only at uh, 2%. So uh, the ability to achieve this good outcome despite, uh, despite having a, a very low adverse event as seen in here. From a gradient, the fear was, okay, we're gonna use a wider clips and that's gonna end up having higher gradient. That's not what we have seen 
and that's not what we have observed at all in this, uh, in this trial. What we have seen is uh, through echo uh, adjudicated results that wider eclipse really did not increase the mean myotic gradient post procedure uh, with an around four millimeter mercury 30 day uh, myotic valve gradient compared to the expand trial, which is almost the same thing. So really, uh, we can use wider clip, have more tissue coaptation, and really still maintain our myotic valve gradient at par for the appropriate anatomy. So really the takeaway from this, this is really the study, this is the first one that looked at the echo core lab, educated outcome at 30 days using the newer generation uh, G4 system and using contemporary approach regarding myotic valve therapy. Compared to the third gen with the introduction of the new additional feature of clip sizes and defending grippers, we had similar procedure effectiveness. Uh, more patients were treated with just one clip and we had faster device time, 39 minutes versus 46 minutes. All these enhancements were obtained without any increase in adverse event. So, uh, so far so good. Uh, really, uh, the more novel therapies right now in our programs is we cannot let people leave our room with uh, moderate MR, mild to moderate MR. We have to keep striving to achieve the lowest gradient we can achieve, as long as the amount of valve anatomy is favorable for that. I'm not, I'm not here saying that we have to keep pushing the envelope with smaller valve areas or with bad tissue leaflet, but when the amount of valve is appropriate from an anatomy standpoint, our goal is to achieve the lowest MR and achieve the highest reduction we can in that case. And uh, the amount clip G4 system, by giving us multiple tools and multiple uh, clips, and the independent gripper actuation system allowed us really to uh, better do our job and really achieve the reduction that we think we should achieve at this point to try to really to be competitive in this field for the future. I'm gonna just talk a little bit about the matter uh, repair MR trial and a small case. Uh, you know, repair MR is looking at the moderate risk uh, patient from a surgical standpoint and looking at the clinical outcome again with the newer novel generation G4 system compared to open heart surgery. And this is in patients who are deemed moderate for surgery by, for repair by, an, uh, by a CT surgeon. It's a prospective randomized multi-center trial uh, for looking at almost 500 patients to be enrolled with the PI being uh, Dr. McCarthy and Dr. Cybercar. Pretty straightforward, really. I love the design of this trial, really straightforward. Uh, severe primary MR, deemed moderate risk by CT surgery. That would be randomized one-to-one -to, -one to surgical multivar repair and the uh, multi clip. I would have never imagined myself treating people with moderate MR uh, without, the, uh, without the new improvements in the multi clip G4 system that allows us to tackle these uh, patients who are younger and actually who are uh, less of a risk and achieving hopefully as much as we can uh, almost immediate surgical life result if we can. The uh, clinical trial end uh, endpoints are really looking at the basic stuff, all cause mortality, stroke, cardiac hospitalization and kidney injury uh, at two years from the index procedure with the other co-primary endpoints looking at the uh, two plus less reduction of mater valve uh, regurgitation from the time of the index procedure up to two years without any further need for a valve therapy. So really a pretty, pretty interesting trial ongoing right now. Hopefully we can advocate for patient with uh, the proper anatomy to be, uh, and uh, for select patient to be uh, considered for this trial. This is an example of a lady, 70 year old lady who was deemed moderate risk in view of her multiple comorbidities uh, for, uh, what happened? Sorry. So this is a lady who has the markers for surgery for uh, Mateva repair. She had uh, significant uh, Mateva leakage of with a regurgitant fraction of 56%, uh, significant P2 uh, prolapse uh, as demon here, an eccentric anterior jet. Uh, really the whole A2P2 system was leaking. And as you see on 3D, you can see the P2 uh, prolapse on the system. Uh, we felt that this is an acceptable case and it's really a straightforward case from our standpoint to put in the trial. 
the uh, echo criteria again uh, had a baseline a mean valve gradient of 3.4 per matter valve area to start with was 5.5 so we felt we have enough room to really achieve the MR reduction we had to do on this case uh, so transeptal puncture was done our first clip of choice here guys if we talk about this is like a, a primary uh, case primary MR so XT, the XT in my mind, XCW. The posterior leaflet was pretty long, about 15 millimeter. It was pretty redundant. So we felt an XCW is really the primary clip to start with this case, and appropriately so, I think. We uh, aligned our first clip at the middle side of A2P2, and uh, really we had a good, uh, good angle. And then we went for the grasp, and our first grab, this is uh, incorrect on the top, our first grabs was really with uh, uh, the dual uh, grippers mode, and then we closed. But as you can see in here, you know, the posterior leaflet was still very floppy, very mobile, and really not uh, of, uh, something that we would not leave like this. So the beauty of the uh, control actuation gripper is allows us to really optimize the grasp, and really for more precise leaflet uh, capture and co-optation. So what we did on this case is we opened up the clip and we left the anterior grippers down and we only uh, uh, pulled up the posterior gripper. And uh, without advancing or moving the clip, we just did some posterior torque, further optimizing with more, in a more precise fashion that posterior leaflet inside all the way down inside the clip. And then we dropped the posterior gripper at that time with more tissue inside the clip and we closed. And you could immediately see the difference at the end in here where really we had already had captured the majority of the posterior leaflet and was much more stable, not moving, not redundant. These are the kind of results that we like to see. So that was released. Uh, that was still as expected. I mean, we, didn't, I mean, we had a wild, uh, wild uh, leakage on that valve. One clip was never our goal in this case. And then, but there was really barely any more medial leakage left. That was felt as a good result for us to deploy the first clip and go from there. So the question here, should we uh, definitely put another clip, but should we put in, what kind of clip would we use? Would we be an XCW again? We put an XT or an NT system. Uh, again, in view of the, uh, still the length of the posterior leaflet, the amount of tissue that is moving, we decide to go with the XT system. We decided to go with the thinner one, not the wider one, because of the gradient and the amount of valve area. So we opted for an XT system, even though like we just talked about the expand G4, say it's less than 3%. It's a great clip for the right valve, for the right anatomy, guys. And then we went in with the XT just lateral at A2P2 of the previous clip. Uh, really pretty straightforward. The whole posterior reef was pretty redundant, came up. Uh, both grippers were dropped on this one and we closed and really uh, we had good tissue capture. We were able to reduce the MR. This is the final post on the left versus the baseline to trace. Uh, fortunately, the mean gradient stayed the same, actually. We started with 3.4 and we ended up with 3.4, mainly by reducing the MR jet. And both clips were stable and that was released. So really, the reason I presented this case is number one, I wanna increase the awareness of the ongoing repair MR trial for Mars rest patient. Select patients should be definitely uh, uh, considered for this trial if it feel, felt appropriate. Uh, what I really want to really increase awareness to take away from this is actually, this is an example where actually the wider clip is pretty important, allows more tissue co-optation. Likely would have used three clips on the previous generation, older generation system versus two like we did on this one. And we still achieve trace result. The independent gripper actuation more really will give you precise tissue co-optation and tissue grasp, as you see in here, options to be used in your toolbox when you're treating these patients. The goal right now in our program, with the contemporary use on how we treat MR is, because like I said before, we have to achieve the lowest MR we can. It's unacceptable to leave anything that we could have reduced if the valve anatomy and it's safe for the patient to be done and it's appropriate. And uh, the G4 system allows us to have all the stuff in our toolbox right now and select an appropriate anatomy to get and achieve that MR reduction. Thank you. So that's a 
Yeah, that was a fantastic talk, and I think for the sake of time, we'll move on to Dr. Singh's uh, talk, but it'll give us a lot of opportunities to discuss individual topics at the end. So approaches and techniques to treating complex cases with mitral clip G4. Thank you, Mike, uh, and uh, thank you, Abbott, for hosting this session. I think my job is relatively easy because I, I just have to do a bunch of show and tell. And uh, when I was in, in uh, fellowship, I had uh, one of my attendings always tell me every case I do is complex. Um, but, but really, I think one, one of my jobs here, if I can get the file to open up, is to really demonstrate the versatility of the Gen 4 system uh, of MitraClip and, and kind of what the thought process is behind these cases. Uh, and I guess while that's loading up, um, you know, Boston, that was a fantastic case. And, and I think it just highlighted that, you know, before we had Gen 4, that would be a type of case where with the, just a regular NT system, we'd be struggling to grasp right where the main pathology was. You would have to start adjacent either you know, in a normal segment and work your way in or anchor the flail segment and bring it in. I think so that the availability of Gen 4 and then now being able to just target the primary area of pathology has really just made a dramatic difference, I think, in all of our practices. And has really allowed to your point, which you keep emphasizing and I totally agree with, is that a lot of our patients need to leave the procedure room with one plus or less MR, if at all possible. surgical like result you know they have to leave the room with the good result with surgery because we're you know that's a seven year old woman with you know decades of life ahead of her exactly but, and, and you guys got a great result and, and you know the, the funny thing is like the whole case time was like 19 minutes and that's two clips and we had to do two grass the first time and use independent gripper mode I mean that would have taken me like an hour in the previous system and, and I think that one plus MR result is now very consistent it's not just you know, the G3 registry, we saw it in COAPT. We're now seeing it in the G4 uh, registry from, from the early data. And, and I think that's really critical to helping, you know, our referring physicians who, who don't know as much about this therapy understand it as a first-line therapy for, for most patients with secondary MR and, and for, for patients who aren't great candidates for surgery. And I think with that one plus MR rate, it can help even surgeons where, you know, not every patient's perfectly, you're not a surgical candidate, you are a surgical candidate. There's a whole spectrum in between that involves a heart team and a discussion about patients' goals and how they're gonna recover post-surgery, whether they live or die. Um, uh, you know, uh, getting that, being able to show consistently that you can get one plus or better in an overwhelming majority of patients helps that decision towards a less invasive therapy. So we've got our slides up and we'll move on. Okay, so my screen for the tech folks in the back, it's still not. Showing this, I don't know if you guys want to advance. Try, try the arrows, yeah. Please call, okay. So go ahead, we'll go to the next slide. Uh, one more, so those are uh, some of my formal uh, uh, disclosures. So, you know, it's interesting. We, we talk about mitral regurgitation classification. We've been talking about primary MR. We've been talking about secondary MR. The surgeons have taught us about, um, you know, Carpentier classifications. And, and really, if you try to put them all in a box, it becomes really challenging. Uh, next slide, or next uh, click. Because not every patient follows a rule, right? And, and classification of mitral regurgitation ends up being very, very complicated. Uh, we, we see this time and time again. I mean, I think uh, Boston showed us a great case of a patient with Carpentier class two, uh, but true primary MR. But, but a lot of patients have mitral annular calcification. They can have annular dilatation, LV dilatation. And so really our job becomes trying to determine what we think is the main primary contributor. Uh, next slide. And then what happens is, in addition to patients not fitting an exact box, their processes change over time. Uh, if you just do the next set of clicks, and what you'll see is a patient who starts off with maybe some class one, over time will develop some class 3A, uh, next click, and over time there'll be a whole host of different pathologies, Carpentier pathologies, that develop. And this can make life very, very challenging as we think about treating these patients. Next slide. And then this always comes up, and the, and the referring doctors will send us um, uh, messages about, hey, what do we think the pathology is? Uh, next slide. And, and this is where that, that frustration comes in pre-Gen 4. You know, we have some very wide flails, some gaps that can be pretty challenging. We talk about some of these 
these, uh, these differences, different techniques to implant the clips. We have incomplete MR reduction, especially as the pathology gets more hostile. Uh, there's been this discussion about spectrum of mitral regurgitation pathology. If you just talk about pure anatomic uh, discussion, right? So if you have these patients on the left-hand side with a green pathology, anatomic pathology, pretty straightforward, central. Then you have the yellow type of pathology. Yellow is kind of the gradients are, are a little bit borderline. There's multiple jets going back and forth. And then you have the really severe hostile, uh, such as severe mitral annular calcification, and those can become quite challenging. We've had very long procedural times. And then, of course, there's operator imager fatigue. Um, you know, Bassam talked about a beautiful case about 19 minutes, but pre-Gen 4, you know, as we're trying to stabilize a lot of our different segments and we're trying to implant clips, I mean, there wasn't, it was not uncommon to have longer procedure times. Next slide. And so now we have the availability of Gen 4, and really I think that has been remarkable. We were all really excited to receive it. Um, I know our, my uh, colleagues here have kind of talked a little bit about each of these clip availability. I won't go into the details, but really this matrix has allowed us to have a toolbox that's, that's better, and perhaps we can match what our surgical colleagues are doing in the operating room for, for some of our patients. Next slide. So, and, and I think Bassam talked a little bit about this, about a workhorse, and we can have this discussion at the end of the session as well as, as what do we consider as, as our workhorse, but really there has been a great interest, and people sure certainly have started using it in their cases of the wider clips, because not only do you get greater vertical coaptation, uh, but you also get horizontal coaptation as well, and, and I'll show you some illustrative cases here. I know this is not, this particular data is not, not a, may not be adjudicated, and we'll certainly see that in the publications from Expand G4 as they come out, but in my own personal experience, and I think a lot of the, my colleagues here on the podium can attest to, is that we certainly have seen a reduction in our procedure times as well for the same pathologies that we have been treating over and over again. Next slide. So here are some illustrative cases. Uh, this might be working now. Um, I don't know if it's easier for me to, oh, never mind. So next slide. So this is now pre-Gen 4, okay? So this is a kind of a prototypical secondary MR case and 81-year-old with ischemic MR. Um, I don't have the ability to use my pointer, but you can see there that there is kind of this ischemic MR. There is a huge PISA originating on the top left picture and you don't necessarily see it splaying back into the left atrium because it's going behind the plane. It's posteriorly directed. This is that patient with that tethered posterior leaflet, and as a result of that, the jet is being driven posteriorly. Hemodynamically, on the top row, you see that there is hemodynamics that are consistent with severe mitral insufficiency, and this is that prototypical on the top right panel. What you see is, is your 3D on FOS view. Now, this is a case that over the years we've learned. When we first approached this type of valve, you would put one NT in the middle, and then you would see jets on either side, and you were like, okay, I gotta move it. And we've evolved from that approach to, you know what, this is gonna take two NTs, so I'm just gonna start, put one NT in the medial aspect of that, that, that jet origination, put another NT just lateral to that, and, and there you can see on the bottom row the result after that. So really, we had figured out NT. NT was, was what was used in COAP, what was used in Everest. The availability of XT was, was I think, fantastic, but, Next slide. From there, we had the availability of, of the Gen 4 system. So what I tried to do was I tried to find a similar pathology that we had now that we had Gen 4 available to when we didn't have Gen 4 available. And look at, look at the results here with just one NTW. So here's a patient again with kind of similar pathology, ischemic MR. There's a wide jet origination at the center of the valve. And what you're seeing is, again, that posteriorly directed jet and, and with hemodynamics that are consistent with it, but with it one NTW right in the middle, you can achieve results that are relatively similar. Uh, next slide. And if you compare both cases side by side, right, so on the left is the patient with NT treated with two NTs. On the right, you see patients treated with one NTW. What you begin to see is that their annular dimensions are relatively the same between the two cases. And the result with one NTW um, certainly kind of provided the same result. Now, these are clearly single center cases, and, and we'll have to see as the expand data comes out, but I do believe from my own personal experiences and the experience of everybody else on the panel that this is some of the results that you are gonna begin to see. So this highlights the, the, what an NTW can do uh, in this type of pathology. Uh, next slide. So 
but, but sometimes you need more than one NTW, or, or you may need more than one clip, and, and you still can do that with a Gen 4 system. Um, you know, we showed that there was an increased reduction of MR um, with the wider clips. Bossom showed you that we didn't necessarily see an increase in the gradients, so we really challenged that in terms of putting more than one W clip on, and can that make a difference? So this is now a patient with ischemic or non-ischemic mitral regurgitation, a dilated LV. This is a patient with a, a cardio or um, chemotherapy-induced cardiomyopathy. So he's got a dilated LV. The, the leaflets are apically restricted. And then what this particular case, we tried to do what we did in the past, where you put one NTW right in the middle. In this particular case, unlike the prior case, there still was pretty substantial jet on either side. Next slide. So very easily, similar to what we used to do, See if it loads up here. Very similarly, well, from what we used to do, we just moved that first NTW to the medial aspect of the valve, and then we put another NTW just on the lateral side of that, and we had pretty substantial mitral regurgitation re reduction, and with a gradient that was only four millimeters of mercury. So this was helpful from that standpoint. Next slide. So we, we talk a lot about N NTWs. We've talked some about XT. XTWs, well, what about an NT? You know, does an NT become like that 308 or the 258 that you just need sometimes to tack things up, or can it be a primary clip that you use? And, and I would argue that it, you could still use it as a primary clip. So here's a patient that originally we considered for, for uh, transapical valve replacement. On the top right, if you look at that 3D on FOSS, look at that dense calcium that is surrounding that entire, entire valve. The patient has severe mitral regurgitation. Now, the gradient's only 3.5, but again, this is a patient that initially I had concerns about putting a clip on and, and whether you know, he would be able to tolerate it. But we considered it, we screened him for tendine, and unfortunately, he had a prohibitive neo-LVOT. He had a very small LV cavity and, and would not qualify. And on the bottom right, you can see his hemodynamics, right? Mean left atrial pressure of 30 with V waves that are approaching 55. Some of that may be LA noncompliance uh, in addition to his mitral regurgitation. Next slide. So one of the beautiful things about this, this system is that you can bring it in and you can put the clip on, you can assess your hemodynamics and then make a determination. If you don't like it, if the gradient ends up being too high, you can take it out. And we continue to learn about these type of cases. Uh, next slide. So on the bottom, you'll see the final results. Next slide. And on the top, I'll show you the pre-results. So with one NT, right at that area where the vast majority of the regurgitation was occurring from, we knew we had abolished the mitral regurgitation. However, the bigger concern, and the concern for everybody in the room is, well, what happened to the hemodynamics? So the patient's gradient stayed at five, and I'm gonna present some data on Thursday, looking from the expand registry on gradients above five and below five, and outcomes based on that. And, and really in this particular patient, with a gradient of five and improved hemodynamics and a single NT, you know, we had provided some pretty dramatic uh, improvement, not from just a color standpoint, from a hemodynamic standpoint, but clinically, this guy's up in Montana fishing now and something that he's always wanted to do. And, and really, I think that's one of the key messages. Next slide. So what about mixing and matching? We talked a lot about that. When would you mix and match? How would you mix and match? So here's a case, and, and it illustrates a couple of things. One is, is that, you know, in cases like this with very severe eccentric jets, as we sit at the beginning of the case and we try to map out the valve and try to determine where the mitral regurgitation is coming from, what are our clipping strategies gonna be, this is a, a, a beautiful example of sitting down at the beginning of the case as your imager is mapping the valve and then coming up with a strategy together. So my initial concern was, was that, okay, we're gonna put one clip right here and you know we can do an NTW or an XTW uh, and, and I think an XTW here, the leaflet lengths are long enough, could certainly be a, a, a valid option. So if you go next slide, one of the things that we have really started using more and more is multiplanar reconstruction. I know there's, there's been a lot of imaging discussions on multiplanar reconstruction, and, and I would argue that as implanters, as interventional cardiologists, it's just as important for us to understand not necessarily how to acquire it, but what am I looking at? So that way when you speak to your imager back and forth, we're all talking the same language. So on the top left is your bicommissural view, and then my imager is kind of bisecting at the medial commissure. And when you bisect it, and it's a 90 degree perfect orthogonal plane, unlike X plane, where you slice it at an angle, that doesn't necessarily represent your true grasping view. But now what you're so showing on the, on the top left with color 
but, but the grasping view, the bisected view, that's my grasping view. And when you take color off and you look at the top right panel, what you begin to see is that there's persistent degeneration of that posterior leaflet all the way at the medial aspect of the valve. So if I had put that clip on initially, an NTW or an XTW right where I started, coming back afterwards to trying to put another clip here immediately would have been quite challenging, even though I have the ability to do so. Next slide. So here's a 3D on FOSS view, and again, my, I don't have the ability to point, but just on the medial aspect of A2P2, you, you see that severe kind of, you know, bilis type uh, posterior leaflet kind of billowing back into the, into the left atrium, but just medial to that, uh, there is some pretty significant degenerative disease there as well. And, and having the ability to have G4, thinking about the different clip sizes available, working in that, that medial aspect of the valve where there's a high density of cords, and then in addition to that, the posterior leaflet lengths are relatively small. You know, we started off with an NT at that particular time. Now, can you use an NTW? I think people have done that successfully. It, it can be technically more challenging. But again, this is that art of tear, which I'll kind of talk about here in a second. Next slide. So after one NTW, next slide. One NT, one NT all the way at the medial commissure, and then another NT sitting right next to it, we pretty much closed off the medial commissure. And this patient started off with severe mitral regurgitation, had a pretty profound hemodynamic result with a pulmonary vein flow, and, and finally from a hemodynamic standpoint as well. So really, the case illustrates that you can kind of tailor the clip to the pathology and leaflet length, the chordal density, and make a determination. You're not obligated and not relegated to just one clip size the whole time. Next slide. So, so I'll close with this case, which is, well, Bossom showed you a great case of, of an XTW, right? And so the question is, is, and this simply is on the same theme, what about an XTW? And, and really, what we've been generally using an XTW for is, is very th kind of long, myxomatous type anterior, posterior leaflets. You want to be able to get at least a full centimeter of leaflet inside. Having the ability to, to use CGA for confirmation and or optimization has really changed our paradigm on, on how easily we can go straight for the main patholo pathologic segment. So if you click on the next slide. And so our concern was is that this particular patient, the entire P2, P3 segment, was disease, but the vast majority of regurgitation was coming from the P2 segment. This is a 90 plus year old patient who's symptomatic and has difficulty playing with the grandkids. So this is a patient who you're thinking, listen, I wanna put one clip in, reduce mitral regurgitation and get him out of my procedure room. Next slide. And this is how the NTW system, uh, and if one more click, is a really big clip. And so you really wanna make sure that as you're in the, in the atrium, as you position and as you orient, as you align, uh, that, that you are you're respectful to the coaptation plane uh, because these clipper arms particularly, or the longer clip arms particularly, if there's any sort of deviation from the coaptation plane can certainly affect torsion and you certainly wanna avoid that. Next slide. And here again is another plug for it. Next slide, if you click it. Um, another plug for, for multiplanar reconstruction, which, especially with the longer clip arms, is really important as you want to maintain your alignment to the line of coaptation. It really allows you to do that while you try to grab, while you try to assess leaflet insertion and or optimization. You can see just very clearly here on the posterior leaflet, you could easily raise your posterior gripper arm, slide that posterior, and maintain your alignment at the entire time as should you choose to do it this way. Next slide. So here's the final results for this particular case. With one XTW, the patient had a pretty profound hemodynamic color improvement, and then on top of that, a very substantial clinical uh, improvement as well on follow-up. Next slide. So I think you know, my job is to talk about the versatility of the Gen 4 system, what we can and cannot do with the Gen 4 system, and, and, and really highlight some of the features. And, and I do agree that Gen 4 has reduced our procedural times. I think perhaps that's with experience, but also less clips and more confidence, I think, in as we assess leaflet insertion. Do we have a lower threshold to raise a gripper and to check to see if leaflet's in there? I mean, if there's any sort of humming and hawing, it just, it's very easy to open the arms and open the grippers and assess. The consistent theme today, I think, has been is that we, as, 
as providers should be targeting one plus, targeting one plus or less mitral regurgitation. We've seen this with increased uh, efficiency. And, and I do believe there is a, a form of patient prosthesis mismatch with MitraClip now. So you have to select the right clip for the right patient. Um, but there's a lot of leeway here. Um, and we, we, if, you, if you sit down and ask five surgeons how they would approach a valve, you would get about 10 answers. And, and so and I think now we're at an era where we're starting to see the art of, of tier. Um, you know, there's a lot of experience on the panel in every single one of these cases that may have approached it just a little bit differently, but that's okay because I think the results would be the same. Uh, and, and really, I think, next slide, and I'll, I'll just end with this table here, which kind of highlights the initial discussion after the first 100 cases were performed. This is by no means, I think, you know, complete rule of law, but it certainly helps guide a lot of physicians that are starting to do clips or as they develop their practices as to what, what you're gonna use, and then you can deviate from this, uh, I think, to some degree, uh, but it really is just meant more for a guidance, so. Thank you. So we have a little bit of time for questions, and certainly from the audience, if there's anybody who has a question, come on up, and we would love to hear your questions as, as, we, as people contemplate that uh, and uh, get the courage to come up. Um, uh, let me ask, so you've got a, a clip in, and um, in, in we're all chasing uh, one plus or, or less MR, which we can get. Um, how much is too much gradient, uh, and how do you make decisions about uh, about uh, uh, about putting in a second clip, uh, and how does other factors like residual mitral valve orifice area that you measure and the patient's specific heart rate and blood pressure at the time and where you're putting the second clip relative to the first clip yeah. all impact on these decisions? Because that's the art. Right. So the art is is really hard to answer in in even the seven minutes that we have left behind. Because every case is different. What you would do or what you, how you would approach a 80, 90 year old patient is very different than how you would approach a 50, 60 year old patient with the same anatomy, I think, um, and, and how aggressive you wanna be with hostile anatomy. Uh, we know based on the COAPT publication that recently came out that if you look at patients with a gradient above five versus a gradient below five, in the COAPT population, there's no difference in overall outcomes. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I'll plug a, a, a six-minute talk that I'm going to give some of the preliminary uh, analysis from the EXPAND registry in both primary and secondary MR patients in a real-world registry, what the outcomes were based on a gradient above five and below five. A small teaser is, is that the vast majority of patients in EXPAND um, in a less than five group were somewhere between three and five, not surprisingly. The vast majority of patients in the above five group were six and seven with very few that were eight, nine, and 10. And, and I think that if it's a 75, 80-year-old patient and they have severe degenerative disease and they have two plus MR and they're at a gradient of about four, four to five, I would certainly consider putting one more clip and I would tolerate a gradient of seven in that patient. Because I think that the MR reduction outweighs any sort of you know, gradient because the gradient is based on historical data from rheumatic mitral stenosis in 30-year-old patients. Our gradients that we set as cutoffs for on ourselves is not validated in this population. Uh, and this is where I'm really interested to see where a lot of this data goes and, and where we go from there. Yeah, I, I would just say that um, for mitral valve replacement, we see gradients pretty typically of four to five. So I, I think, you know, that's pretty normal. Yep. But other thoughts? Yeah, this is one of the, I think, the real kind of things we struggle with. They're, they're, I think your point, which is the most important, is know your patient. You know, if they're, if they're 89 and it's the first clip and you got a gradient of seven or eight, but everything else looks good, we might, ex you know, we might work a little bit, but if that's what we're gonna get, that's what we're gonna get. We might tolerate that. Younger patients, I think I'm a little less willing to tolerate higher gradients. Um, sometimes we see left atrial spontaneous echo contrast or smoke in the left atrium, which is a little ominous. Usually I view that as a point to maybe take the clip off. That's not always associated with these high gradients, however. So. I don't know if you have any insight into that. Um, but I, I do think, I'd love to see your data on Thursday. Um, the problem with that is this is all the gradients we're willing to tolerate, mm -hmm. right? And so um, whether or not, you know, whether or not that, that guides us or that we just keep doing what we're doing is, is kind of something I'll wait to hear from you on Thursday, yeah. how should approach that. So. so what about repair MR patients? Yeah. You know, I, we, we talk about the expand population, which is the average age is 75, 80, 70. I think 70, 75, definitely above 70, but what about the repair MR population? And, and 
this is the population I, I don't know if I've decided whether I would tolerate a six or seven. And well, the, the trial, you have to be less than five. Less than five. If you can, I mean. Uh, what I have noticed regarding the gradient is definitely know your patient, but the more active the patient, the less they tolerate higher gradient. So if you have an 89-year-old or an 85 who is active, uh, some of them, some of mine still bike, some of them. He would not tolerate a gradient of eight like someone who is just sitting home watching TV. Uh, so you have to know your patient. It's, there's a lot of unanswered questions. We need more data about this. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I mean, I'm waiting for your data on Thursday. I think that's a very important yeah. thing. Uh, but for the repair MR for the younger patient, I mean, I would be cautious not to go above five. But, uh, but we really don't know. I mean, if you, let, let's say you had a, a nice repair case like you showed and you got a great result like that, but the gradient was six. Would you take the second clip off? Would you no. go to a smaller, yeah. I would not. Right, so I, I wouldn't either. But I, I, think, <laughs> I think we still don't know what we yeah. don't know about this. And one limitation of, of the, which I think with Gen 4 expand, the phase two part, which we'll have a better answer of, is, is, is and again, I'll give you a little teaser, is that most of the gradient data that I'll be presenting is really 30-day gradients, right? And 30-day gradients is great, but how does that help everybody in the room in the middle of a case decide what gradients do I stop? Uh, there are some patients where the gradient is six, but may get down to five the next day. There are other gradients who was a five, and then may get up to a six or seven the next day. And, yeah. and so there's this dynamic process of gradients, MR, heart rate, blood pressure, loading conditions, and, and we continue to learn so much about that and, and there's so much variability that I, I struggle with it all the time. Interproceduralmente, do you, and I'll, I'll throw this away, but do you push the blood pressure, do you try to control the heart rate and create, yeah. we will do that. We'll get our anesthesiologist to get the blood pressure up to assess gradient and MR. Um, how, how do you decide that? Uh, our practice or my practice is generally to focus on physiologic mm -hmm. blood pressures and physiologic heart rates. If, if a patient who I know generally lives in the 120s, 130s, you know, we won't assess their MR gradient at 80 when their systolic is 80. Yeah. Same thing if for some reason they're verticardic into the 40s, but I know that they're usually in the 60s or 70s. We try, might try to make that assessment. It's, it's fortunately, I think our cardiac anesthesiology colleagues are fantastic. And for the most part, I haven't seen an, or heard about a pandemic of, of, you know, altered hemodynamics during mitral clip cases. I think they, for the most part, they do a pretty, job, pretty good job of maintaining the physiologic status of the patient throughout the case. All right, we have like less than two minutes left. Let me ask you really quick, just quickly, uh, non-central MRs, you know, medial lateral commercial work where you're less worried about gradient, um, uh, more worried about cords. What's your clip selection? Um, if I'm in the commissure is NT, um, and, and I've, I will entertain an NTW um, away from the commissures. NT. NT. Excellent. And that leaves us about uh, 60 more seconds. Any other thoughts or, or, or reflections from the panel? I would just say it's a really exciting time um, to be a part of mitral clip therapy, to be a part of tier therapy. I think the Gen 4 system shows a dedication on, on Abbott's side to, to really continue to push improvements and innovation. And then with ability to have expand the dedication to, to, not, to further the science, to further the evidence. And that's a really high bar uh, that I think a lot of other folks should look at. It, it really is a dedication that I think it's, it's a, I'm really proud to be kind of be involved with. Yeah. I think that's thank a you. great way to finish. Yeah, this. that's great. I agree. All right. Well, thank you everyone for attending. Uh, it was really great sessions. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.